everyone. My name is Anastasia Belais. I'm with Miami Freedom Project. I'm very happy to welcome our guest, Max Benning from Prison Florida. If you're not familiar with the organization, we are about changing the conversation around what it means to be progressive in Miami. So we're very excited to have someone who is doing that work every day. Welcome, Max. Um, you're for here for our first show. Yeah, so I'm excited. I'm pi pioneering it. <laughs> Wonderful. So I'd love to, we, you know, we've done a lot of work together. And I think when you're in these movement spaces, you just have these issues that you're following, and then you just touch upon other groups that where there's alignment. But I would love to hear from you, what brought you to Florida? What brought you to Prison Florida? Yeah, so we actually started as a high school club. I was the vice president and then co-president of my high school GSA. And it had become a very, very hostile space to a lot of queer students. And so we really felt that we needed a clean slate, a fresh start. And so we started PRISM uh, really with the intention of, of doing that. Got a lot of pushback from school admin. Um, they didn't like the idea of having more than one LGBT club. And so after a year of fighting, you know, our leadership were, you know, about to graduate and we decided let's just start a nonprofit and, and, and sort of expand beyond one school and out into the community. And, and here we are four years later. So it's been in the last four years. So four years ago, you were a high school student. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've seen you, you do a lot of work with high school students. So you were them up mm -hmm. until very recently. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me a little bit about what, what, made you, what made you choose yourself? What made you think that you were the person who was going to step into the space and stay in the space as, as, after you graduated? I think a lot of it was that it, it wasn't being done, right? I think that there was not enough support for queer students. I, I also think, you know, in particular, we do a lot of work on social media, and that's something that was not happening and, and was a very, very dire need, especially in the wake of the pandemic. And I think if, if, if not me, then who is sort of the situation that we were faced with. What has been your experience in these last four years of organizing around this issue in particular? I think... For many of us, we're, we've become aware of LGBTQI plus issues in the schools in a kind of crisis mode. We, we're, we're hearing about things, rights that are being taken away um, that I think for me, per speaking personally, I think for maybe some of us who are, some people who are listening, we thought it was going in the right direction. We thought, you know, progress was slow, too slow or too fast for some people, but it was going in one direction. Then we've seen a kind of turnaround. So what has your experience been like organizing specifically on this issue in Florida? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to recognize just like how quickly these things have happened. I, I say this a lot, but, you know, I actually, I, I hail from Palm, the Palm Beach County Public School District, which is like one of the most progressive school districts in the country and has been for quite some time, especially in terms of like LGBT rights and support for queer students. And, you know, when we started as a nonprofit in 2020, that was that was very much still the case. Um, they were... I remember I'd spoken with a staff member talking about all the LGBT initiatives that they had, and they had you know LGBT inclusive books in every single school library. They had all these non discrimination protections and LGBT inclusive sex ed. They had they were working on like dedicated course codes at the high school level for like LGBT specific like history like whole history classes, um, and imagining that now is is crazy right just three or four years later the the situation that we're that we're facing in florida is is completely different right and and it's it's been really really hard to see that you know coming coming out of high school you know witnessing how quickly that experience for students and in, in the k through 12 sphere has has changed from from what i experienced which was a very very inclusive environment for queer students um and so i think that um you know, a lot of it has been sort sort of trying to claw our way back to you know to a to a state in a, in a school environment where students feel safe or have you know at least some semblance of safety, some semblance of representation, and then obviously that they're they're actually learning about the world around them. But I think this year we're really starting to see um, we're really starting to see things come back around and mm -hmm. and, um, and and really starting to get a little bit more hope. When you're working in this issue and you're seeing this this kind of backslide, how do you think people change over? Do you think it was something people were uncomfortable with how open it was becoming, the conversations that were being had? Or do you think something was introduced that made it okay to not be comfortable, that made it okay to speak speak against or, or to organize against LGBTQ youth? Which are, these are, it, it is also worth rem remembering that a lot of times these are 
organizations that are coming from up from within the student population. So sometimes what I'm surprised at when I'm in some spaces with you is that they're speaking about children. They're speaking about not maybe not child, young children, but they're speaking about young people. Um, and it's coming from adults. And I feel like it's such a disproportionate, it can feel so hurtful to come from people who you should be looking up to that they're in some way working against young people. So what is your feeling of that? Do you feel like it became permissible, it became okay to not be comfortable with some of these uh, new ideas or kind of new ways of talking about these issues that people were already having? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is, is conservatives are really good at messaging. Like, you know, just, just, just being honest, I think that um, I often liken the, the don't say gay and trans law, for instance, to no promo homo laws, which were implemented in like peak AIDS epidemic, like, like 80s and 90s. And they basically stated that teachers couldn't promote a homosexual lifestyle in schools. And these things that all started getting repealed over the past decade and a half um, by like state legislators that are still conservative, right? That even even those conservative legislatures are realizing like these things are just kind of outdated. And so we saw that law in particular as like, uh, you know, ha having that understanding of LGBT history is like, okay, that's obviously equally like archaic and outdated and, and we need, uh, you know, and, and, and there's no way that this is going to pass, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's no way that anyone's gonna get behind it, but the reality is it's been masked in this, uh, you know, in this, in this uh, pretty like shell of parents' rights and the parental mm -hmm. right movement. I think that's something that we really start, started taking a new, uh, you know, really started taking a new shape with, with the mask mandates and, and the, the, the sort of birth of Monster Liberty in 2020, um, you know, before mask mandates became less of a hot button issue and, and they needed to find something else to pivot to and it was queer people. Um, and so, and so the, the timing lined up just right for them to be able to, you know, push through this messaging that makes something like a no, what is essentially a no promo homo law, um, and what is, is, you know, generally been seen as really, really just hurtful and bigoted as much more palatable. You know, I think it's interesting that you bring up messaging because part of the work that we do is focusing on Latino communities. And when you think about don't say gay, it is a very strong message. Don't say gay, the first thing you say, why can't you say gay? Like the, the idea is that it, it, it makes, it, it, it immediately prompts a question. And I think one of the things that we've seen that's really challenging in organizing around these issues in South Florida is it doesn't translate easily into Spanish. And the translation to Spanish language is mostly around parental rights. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also a subject that people could understandably say, of course I want my parental rights. I think especially if you're coming out of an autocratic regime, if you're here for a reason, we have majority foreign born people in South Florida, they're more likely to have experienced some kind of totalitarian or dictatorship or kind of state fail situation. The idea that you're gonna be able to protect your children with everything within your capacities is there. And I think that that could be weaponized, that the idea that parental rights could be seen as infringing upon the rights of other students around teachers' ability to be able to teach and to define the curriculum and what happens in our school library. It's, it's taking something that should be positive and turning it in a way that can be seen as, as negative or infringing on other people's rights. And that's a very hard conversation mm -hmm. to have mm -hmm. in Spanish, which is, have you had any experience in your own organizing where there's, a diff there's an issue or it can become more difficult to communicate with South Florida community, which is going to be speaking in Spanish and Creole, be more responsive to messaging that you may not have access to? Yeah, I mean, sometimes, and, and we're, we're grateful to, you know, to have, you know, Spanish-speaking staff that are able to, you know, when it comes to, to press, for instance, that are able to communicate with, like, Sp the Spanish-speaking press and, and uh, you know, and, and make, uh, you know, rallies and things like that accessible to Spanish speakers or folks who are more comfortable speaking in Spanish than English. And uh, and so in that way, we've been able to do that. But that's that's not a reality, you know, just institutionally that we're really able to access, you know, that we're able to access Spanish speakers. And, and you're right, there's also, there's also that, that very very real like generational trauma that you know that comes from like leaving a like a, a dictatorship right um, and coming and coming to this country and and uh, that and oftentimes trauma can be weaponized and I think that unfortunately in many cases it is yeah well I, I, I appreciate so much of the work and I've seen you in spaces you know you lead these really powerful sessions and I, I, I recommend everybody go to prism look at their events, look at where, where your training sessions are, because there's, they're always, 
there's an issue, there's something that you're trying to move forward, but then there's always a direction towards empathy. Um, what the person's trying to communicate, why this issue resonates, why it could be hurtful, why this is an opportunity to diminish that hurt or to block it, protect um, to in, very much in favor of students. And one thing that always stood out for me um, in October when there was a, a law to, or there was a hope that we can have an LGBTQ month in Miami-Dade Public mm -hmm. Schools, you know, you said, you know, you have to be very present for people, can be very hurtful. And I thought, I'm prepared for it. I'm not, I'm not, go it's not going to be, I'm not going to personalize it, I'm not going to internalize it. I understand where this, this board is, I understand where this, you know, where the community is, I can sit through this, but it's difficult. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to see something that for you, and I can, again, only speak for myself, but is so simple that there's this group of people, there's this wonderful history, you should teach it to students. You can just make it available to students, not in what we think of as a keeping them safe way necessarily, even though that is important when you think about how this community has been um, marginalized, but in a way that you want to celebrate them. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a positive. It's mm -hmm. not only a reactive way that you're, you know, you, it's not that you have to do this. You should want to do this. Um, and to see something that to me is such a positive message and have people one after the other say such harmful things that the kind of space that you need to create within a conflict area mm -hmm. is so valuable. And I think you've done that really well. Can you talk to me about what it is to be in a space giving public comment, um, at, whether it be at a school board or at county or at Tallahassee where you felt like you had to step in in a meaningful way to make sure that the people who were speaking felt safe, not physically safety, safe, even though that was a problem, but emotionally safe so that they could express themselves. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I've given so many testimonies and so many bodies, and I still am just, it's just gut-wrenching, like, every single time to, like, ha like have your humanity stripped from you. Well, not every time, but a lot of times, like, it can be really, really, um, uh, you know, damaging to the to the psyche and to the self to, to be dehumanized and belittled like that. And I think that it's so important, you know, especially when we do the speaker trainings, right, that we have a, we have, we're very intentional and we've very quickly had to become very intentional about, um, about really emphasizing, you know, you know, the, the, the importance of, of, being whole in your in your heart and in yourself and, and coming into those meetings that we that we make sure that folks know that there is space that there are people to talk to you know they're physically on site that there is that there is a community behind them and supporting them because uh, it can be really really hard not only um, uh, you not not only obviously to see opposition and, and folks see really really hurtful really really damaging things but then to just do it yourself right like mm -hmm. that you know and to, to I think that stories have power and stories have value and when you when you when you give them when you tell them um you're you're also giving that value to somebody right mm -hmm. and somebody who might vote uh, you know even even you know might receive that and then just throw it in a dumpster and, and completely ignore ignore you and your story and your life and your perspective and that can be really really hurtful to have that happen and so it's so important that we're able to first of all prepare people right mm -hmm. like let them know like this is this is what the vote's looking like right now like these are where this is where we're looking at people standing um you know these are the groups that are going to be there these are some of the things that they're probably going to say um you know here's a safety plan but also you know we are here for you right like there are people here for you and, and please at no point should you feel that that you know that your your peace needs to you needs to be perpetually violated that you can you can take space and we can make space for that and you, you're very effective in that and I think to me it's always almost like an experiment because you're in these spaces and you can get you have two comments back to back and you think the room's against us and then you have three comments, and you're like, the room's with us. And it just, it's these ebbs and flows. It's just that this I think emotional whiplash. It's this emotional whiplash. And I think it, you appreciate how the, the, sometimes the issues that you're trying to push back against, there's this imperative. When you feel outnumbered, when you feel that this is where my community's at, this is where my city's at, this is where my state is at, you can feel hopeless. And it, you, sometimes you can forget that it really is about enough people speaking they're, they're still there. You always have to have hope that those people are still there. They maybe haven't felt like they can speak up. So it's a very courageous thing that you're doing because you are giving people, okay, we have this many students are gonna know that this many people felt like they could be present in this moment. 
Um, and that just gives them a sense that there, there's, you have to hope that they're, they're thinking there's more people out there like this. These are just the ones that are here now, but I didn't think they were here. So now there's, there's it's gonna be always exponentially more. Um, I would love for you to talk about, I know that you were very involved in, we, we just concluded our Florida State legislative session. Thank God. Um, I, I would say for me, there were some issues that we were very um, involved in and very um, focused on. It. it It can be difficult because you do look at it as what it, we didn't have the success that we wanted, but there could have been greater harm. And I do, I think there was a lot of momentum that we maybe had last year that I felt that momentum less because our organizing was so strong and I, you were very much a part of that. So can you talk to us a little bit about what issues you were tracking and what your experience was like in Tallahassee? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I will say, you know, I, talk, I talked earlier about hope and how like this is the year that we're like seeing things turn back around. And I really do mean that. I think in so many ways we're seeing this stuff crumble, right? Mm -hmm. When it comes to like court wins on, on so many of the, the bills that have passed last year, uh, you know, in the, in the year prior, uh, but also in terms of legislative session, right? Um, you know, we had 22 anti-LGBT bills introduced to session and 21 of them were killed or neutralized. Um, we, had, we had one pass, it was uh, the Stop Woke Teacher Training Bill, mm -hmm. um, which, which you know, bans, bans essentially DEI training mm -hmm. for, for teachers in, in public schools. Um, but although that's a loss, that's a lot of bills killed. And yeah. I think that's important to recognize um, so many bills that just never even made it to a committee or were never heard in the Senate. Um, and I think, um, you know, acknowledging that these things are, are falling apart, acknowledging um, you know, that I think is really important. We did have, we did have some, some losses that are really, 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 really specific to us that, that, that impact us pretty greatly, namely the, the social media bans. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there were, there were a number of bills that restrict minors access to social media, um, uh, and, and, and passed with just absolutely staggering margins. Mm -hmm. We had a, it was it, HB3 is the one that, that wound up carrying through um, and it passed like 109 to four or something ridiculous, mm -hmm. um, which is really, really unfortunate. Um, I think, uh, and I think part of the issue, right, is is again in terms of, in terms of messaging, but also it just being a very, very, uh, I'm not going to say a new issue. It's something that that folks have been, you know, mulling over for for a better the better part of a decade or longer. But uh, you know, something that folks have really been debating over over solutions to. Um, it is always our opinion that young people deserve to have their voices heard. Mm -hmm. That young people deserve to be able to access that the 21st century's town square and public forum. And and we firmly believe that that banning their access to social media and banning their access to, to resources like especially like the ones that we provide, um, it, it's just not it's just not the right right way to address. The, the harms of social media. I think that is a very, it, it's a difficult issue to track because I think, and I don't, I don't, I think this is unfortunate. I feel like we're living in very polarized times. Mm -hmm. So it can be very easy to think about it on basis of values. So you think you have, these are your values, these are the issues that align with those values and this is what you push for. And we could potentially say that on social media, particularly in this last le legislative session, people who you could assume share your values on other issues weren't weren't with you on this. Mm -hmm. So just to understand what where do you think that breakdown was? What made this bill something that was bipartisan and maybe unfortunate ways when we think about Yeah, I mean oh, I, good they're getting along. This isn't necessarily a positive always. Yeah, yeah. I mean I, I think to some extent it's a it's a level of grandstanding, right? That you know, we know that social media causes really significant harms. We know that these are like massive, massive companies that do profit off of people and unfortunately do profit profit off of children, right? They profit off of our time and our attention and our energy. And so they they specifically engineer these platforms to be addictive and 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 oftentimes really harmful, especially for, for vulnerable people like young people. Um, although I think young people are stronger than we give them credit for. Um, but I, again, I think I think you, we have to square that with with you know our our right to be able to express ourselves, our right to be able to be able to advocate for ourselves, um, and so I think it's not even necessarily a. 
I don't even think it's necessarily uh, a, a, a schism in values mm-hmm. or a schism in, in you know, what we identify as, as a real and pervasive problems. It's maybe a prioritization issue to some extent. Mm-hmm. I think it's a, I think it's a solution issue, right? When we address like what, what are the, what are the sacrifices that we're willing to make to, um, to put a stop to certain harms? And I think that this was a, a poor judgment call. And in, in our mm-hmm. opinion, I think there's, I think there's a, you know, a level of Tallahassee politics that are involved in, in, you know, and how, um, significant uh, of a vote that was, right? You know, we, where we had a b- bipartisan co-sponsorship for the bill as well. I think was a big part of why it was so, so successful is because they had they had a Democrat that was that was also co-sponsoring the bill, mm-hmm. uh, and I think that it, it it lands a lot of people in really really difficult situations where they have to assess what their what their priorities and values are in those moments. Um, I, I think to some extent, most folks in Tallahassee know that that bill is not going to not going to stand like constitutional muster. It's going to be struck down in the courts, and mm-hmm. and I think more than anything, I don't even know that it's it's uh, a practice in policy making so much as it is a practice in threatening social media companies, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I think mm-hmm. that uh, we need to light a fire under some of these companies, but you know, it's unfortunate that that this is the route that that we've gone to do that. Yeah, no, I appreciate that nuance because I, I, you, it, it almost makes you appreciate that there is a conversation to be had, mm-hmm. and that there needs to be a better conversation, better conclusions. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think it's you know we can anticipate some litigation. For sure, no, <laughs> ab- ab- absolutely. It's we one can, of those yeah. moments. I think we have so much in the last um, in Florida in the last since since 2018, where you just you you see this legislation you're like this can't be this can't be constitutional right. and. A lot of times it's not. A yeah. lot of times it does play out in the courts. But I think my concern is always, while we're, we're while we're putting out these fires of things that we don't want, what are the things that we should be asking for? What mm-hmm. are the things that we can be? How mm-hmm. can we be moving forward in ways that we're not while we're passing something, um, maybe along party lines, maybe around bipartisan mm-hmm. lines, but that can't w- can't can't withstand the exactly. challenges because it was an overreach in the first place, and and it's kind of understood that it, that's going to be the case. Yeah, of course, and it's and it's so unfortunate that that we they were constantly put in a position of defense, like being on defense, right? They mm-hmm. were constantly having to push back against against bad bills and against uh, and against things that might cause harm to the community. Um, and aren't really able to push forward and aren't able to focus on on spectacular things. Like there were great great bills that were introduced. I, they never would have seen the light of day with the makeup of our legislature, but but things like the Freedom to Learn Act, for instance, which was uh, uh, sponsored by the, the very same person who sponsored the social media ba- the social media ban, right? Like really, really great bills that um, that but, but we're we're so busy like f- having to having to push back and, and do harm reduction and all of these other things that are being introduced that that we're not really able to um, to find the space and find the energy to to push forward for for the for amazing things, and there were some amazing things that did pass. Uh, there was a uh, there's one that expanded access to PEP, for instance, uh, mm-hmm. for, for for folks who have been exposed to HIV, um, and there are there are ways that we're still finding, you know, that we're still finding to move forward, um, even amidst all of that. Can you talk to me about the public safety? So we saw some rollbacks proposed around Parkland that were passed in light of Parkland, and mm-hmm. I think were very effective in mm-hmm. um, a direction that we would want to go more into, but then there was this, there were, there were challenges. And that was, I, I believe that was something where you gave public comment mm-hmm. or you pushed back. Mm-hmm. Um, can you describe that experience for me and, and what that? Yeah. So, so the bill was HB 1223 um, and it would have rolled back one of those, one of those provisions um, from, from the act that passed after the Parkland shooting um, by decreasing the uh, minimum age to purchase the firearm from 21 back to 18. Um, which, you know, that's a, that's a real prime demographic mm-hmm. for school shooters. So, you know, I think it's a very, very, uh, it's a very, very important safeguard to, to have in place. Um, and, uh, so I, I gave public comment. There was not a lot of people in that room. I must say I was one of like, I think I was one of like seven people that spoke total, probably one of like four that spoken that mm-hmm. spoke against it. Um, Normally, when you give public comment, they'll they'll tell you, you know, hey, you have you have sixty seconds, you have thirty seconds, you have however long, uh, and, you know, sometimes longer. And they never did. Um, mm-hmm. They didn't. They didn't for any of these bills. The entire the entire committee meeting, um, and uh, so you know, I, I timed it, you know, from my chair just in case to make sure it wasn't anything crazy. It was a minute forty five, and um, and so I, I get up to the podium and I start start giving giving this mm-hmm. this testimony, and you know, it's fire, it's passionate. Yeah. I'm, 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 love some poetry um <laughs> and about hurt. a about a minute in uh the the chair goes uh thank you sir 
and I just kept going. And then he just keeps saying, thank you, sir. He doesn't mm-hmm. say, hey, your time is up, you know, please wrap it up in one more sentence. He just keeps saying, thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. And then he cuts my mic. And then I yell, if you're killing kids, you're going to listen. At this point, security had already started coming up to me um, right when they were about to cut my mic. I finished the rest mm-hmm. of my testimony with a cut mic. Uh, they heard it. I don't know if, I don't know if Florida, Florida Channel heard it, but they sure did. And, uh, and then I had, you know, within, within 20 seconds of, of my mic being cut, they had, a, they had a security guard on either and grabbed me by the arm and, and dragged me out the room. Yeah. I mean, I do admire that you were able to stay steady in that moment, um, stay cool. I, I, it can be, because I do think there's so many processes if you're giving public comment, if it's anywhere, if it's at your neighborhood association, if it's at the school board, if it's at the city hall, it's intimidating. Mm-hmm. Um, the forms you have to fill out, the questions, um, the 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 little you know, have you practiced it? Do you are that you knew you were you were not over time that you were able to have a sense of this is what's supposed to happen, and if for any reason this interrupted, I'll know why, mm. and I'll be able to speak to that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really admire that you were you were able to to remember your training, and all of that, and exercise your rights. I think. Mm-hmm. You know, to the extent that what's available to you, what's accessible to you, you made full use of it. Um, and there's another, we're, there's a school board meeting coming up, mm-hmm. um, and I know there's an issue that you've been organizing around that I believe is very important. We, you know, we're always in that civic engagement space of how can we make this accessible mm-hmm. to everyone? So can you talk to me about um, HD13 and what you're hoping will happen? Yeah, so so H thirteen is a uh, is a item that's been introduced by the Miami Dade County School Board. Um, it is an entirely student driven resolution. So we've been working with uh, Youth Action Fund and MDCPS students um, who uh, reached out to us because and re- reached out to us and Youth Action Fund because they were not really able to to have their voices heard, um, mm-hmm. you know, in in their education and in the school board in particular, and um, so we worked up a list of demands um, w- with them that. Uh, wound up becoming the school board item. So again, like entirely student student driven, mm-hmm. which is spectacular. I'm I'm so stoked about that specifically. But what it would do is it would increase student accessibility to the school board in, in a number of ways, right? So it would give them more direct access to the student advisor who's a, a, a non-voting member of the school board meant to represent student voices. Um, it would um, create quarterly town hall forums mm-hmm. uh, specifically for students. It would create recognition programs for students who get especially engaged. Um, and, uh, and then it would also like automatically distribute agendas to every student because those things are often hard to find and hard to access mm-hmm. even for like me and it's my job, right? So mm-hmm. <laughs> I think uh, in so many ways it, it, it so greatly expands access, um, uh, you know, for, for young people to be able to have a voice in their own education system as like the primary stakeholders of public schools and of public education. Um, and uh, so it's gonna be heard on Wednesday. We're super, super, we're super, super excited for a really, really strong uh, student showing, and then so many, so many people who are who are going to be coming, um, you know, to to speak and 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 be there in solidarity with students as well. Um, you know, I think it's so important that um, you know in this moment we're mm-hmm. able to uplift young voices, and uh, and and especially now because it's it's a it's a way that will really, really impact, um, you know young voices, you know, for, for a, a really, really long time. Yeah, I think that's, th- that's amazing. Um, it is hard to imagine why, I just think everything that we ask students to understand, uh, it, this is such, that they would have this ability to immediately operationalize it and access it and practice it, mm-hmm. doesn't make sense. It's like, you know, you, if you can have a model UN or a student government, why wouldn't you give them this pathway to speak directly to the people who are speaking for them. And is if you wanted to support, what are what are some of the thresholds to support? Like if you want if you know, you know I know that the meetings on Wednesday but giving public comment would be wonderful if you can attend a training, that's wonderful. We're offering one tonight. If you can give a you know if you what what are some of the other avenues where people can advocate and support this this initiative? Yeah, absolutely. So so there's a number of ways we, mm-hmm. we try to keep it again accessible. Um, so obviously speaking at the school board meeting itself is is really really critical. Um, you know being able to to 
be there and the school board has to the school board members have to look you in the eye while you say like please give a voice to young people and give a voice to your students that's really really powerful um, but in addition there are some other ways that, that folks can um, that folks can get engaged and show support um, one of which is a letter writing campaign mm -hmm. um, we have a we have a um, a letter writing campaign through Action Network, um, where it's super super easy. It takes like less mm -hmm. than sixty seconds. You just put your name, your 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 first name, last name, your phone number, and your address, and then it'll send the letter to you know all all the school board members, uh, urging them to vote yes on the item. Um, that's that's a really really powerful way. You know, flooding their inboxes, showing just the, the sheer amount, a number of people um, in Miami Dade that are the, you know that that support this item. I think is super super important. And then also uh, calling. Your mm -hmm. school board members. So please, if you don't know, if you don't know your school board member and your district, fix that. Mm -hmm. um, and you can you can find the, the map on the, the MDCPS site. Um, and and call your school board member and tell them you know why this is important to you, why it is why student voices being uplifted is important to you, and why they should vote for it. Um, and that's that's another really really impactful way that you can really put um, your voice and mm -hmm. your and your personhood behind that support. Um, yeah, you know, and really show that there are real people behind this, uh, I think is, is really, really critical. So, so all of those mm -hmm. are, are so, so, so important. And then, um, and then obviously share that, share all of those things with friends and family, right? Get other people to do it as well. I think absolutely, and I think it's one of the things that we're always constantly messaging about. We're going into presidential election mm -hmm. year, um, general election. I know we're all gonna get a million texts. We're mm -hmm. all going to send out a million texts. We're all gonna be phone banking and knocking on doors and it's gonna be this full activation of certainly in our city and then across the state. But I think sometimes it's, it's hard to overlook. The phone call is so important. I think you call these offices and the person who answers sounds bored and they are, but they're bored because probably the thing that they have to do that day is sit down, and get speak to the constituent, put which column they're in, yes, no, for, or against, because they will be asked. These representatives, however, if you're Republican, if you're Democrat, they are tracking these numbers, and I've never been in a situation or I've never been in a public meeting where someone on the days doesn't say, how many people have called my office? And they have to pull that number up. And I think we get inundated with messages on, on social media we're always hearing from, from other people and you could think that a problem is so large that you can forget that there's this one small action that you can mm. take mm. that is very meaningful, that right. the person is there, they're answering the phone, they are taking the call. And you have to, you know, you have to feel like you can, you can take that next step. Yeah, and I think and, and I think that those things are so powerful. Unfortunately, they're also in some ways those actions are being delegitimized. De mm -hmm. You know, we 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 did the letter writing campaign, and we're still doing the letter writing campaign. And I encourage everyone to sign letters. The reason that I also say it's important to put a voice in it, and a person mm -hmm. person behind it, if you're able to, if you can't send the letter, at least at least that. Yeah. Um, but why I think it's so important to put put a voice and a and a face to it is because you know this this item was heard in committee on Wednesday, and you know there were um, you know there were school board members who who read out a list of cities that aren't in my Miami mm -hmm. of people who signed the letter. So there was maybe one person in, in St. Louis, Missouri, mm -hmm. and like one person in New Mexico. And so they're like, this is all, you know, these aren't even our constituents. And so I think that's why it's even more important if you're in Miami Dade, write a letter so that they're just getting, like, at, at a certain point, the report, yeah. the, 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 the stats don't lie. And they're going to be like, well, never mind. Actually, I'm not, not going to bring that one up. Yeah. Um, and, and because the, the sheer number, I think, is, I think is, is also so, so, so important in addition to, you know, putting a face behind it, putting a yeah. voice behind it. And, giving them a ring or showing no, up to the meeting. Absolutely, I think we think about all this message and one of the most important things you can say is, this is my zip code. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this, mm -hmm. is, this is who you represent mm -hmm. and this is how you have this to. Is, this is the school I go to. I'd like you to vote. This is, the kid, this is the school I teach at. This is the school my kids go to, uh -huh. right? Like this is my district, this is my zip code. Like really, really connect it, I think is so important. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think, I do think it's powerful. I grew up, I went to Miami-Dade County Public Schools and it's, you realize that the things that are available to you aren't going to be available to someone else. And I think about, you know, that my mother was just able to, single mom, point to a school and say, there, that's where you're gonna go. And that there was a quality of education and an engagement that 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 was that she could that, that could be managed for her, that she wasn't gonna be able to be present at every meeting, but that she, I was gonna be taken care of. And I think the idea that some students will not have that care because they will be more vulnerable than 
than the larger population. That already happens when you're young. I think when there's something that you can do to help make sure that all of our student communities are protected, there's no reason not to do mm -hmm. it. You mm -hmm. have to. So thank you so much for the work. I think we, we want to do, we, we want to try something on you okay. that we haven't done before. Are we good with time as far as so do our messages? All right. So we really wanted to, Miami Freedom Project, we want to hear from other people in Miami, not just about what they're anxious about or what they're pushing back against, but kind of like where Miami gets us right mm -hmm. in the heart space. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be, or we're going to do a little lightning round okay. of questions. Okay. There's no right or wrong answers. Okay. It's I'll just find a way to get them wrong. First, so there's no right or wrong, but you will be judged. Um, okay. So we've talked about some things we're worried about. First question, what is Miami doing right? Ooh. I think what Miami's doing right is that it's just such a vibrant community, right? That like you can get anything you want in Miami. You can mm -hmm. get the beach, you can get the clubs, you can get Pylea, <laughs> you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever you desire. Um, I think it's all I, the quantities. Literally, <laughs> like you could like you can pick a anything that any other city has, like Miami has. All right, nice. We, you know, we can we can get we can be a little hard on ourselves, but that's, that's dynamic. Little bit here. It's the di it's it's how dynamic it is. It's dynamic. This one is going to be. You just have to pick one. What is Miami doing wrong? Oof. <laughs> Urban planning. Okay. But Miami's two hours from Miami, and I <laughs> think I think it's so hard to get around. Um, I think that's that's the one. One big parking lot, and that needs to be addressed. This one, you can just, you know, you can just take a second. What is your most nostalgic Miami memory? And it could be w from childhood. It could be from when you were younger. It could have been five minutes ago. I think we all have these moments of Miami nostalgia. Hmm. Ooh, this one's, this one's hard. I mean, I think, I think something fairly recent. I think, like, I think when we flooded the, um, the public comment of the school board meeting mm -hmm. after like the month after they voted against recognizing LGBT history month, which is like such an amazing reclamation of power. And I think like the, the photo that we took outside of the school board meeting after, which is like the, the most spectacular and like fueling moment of community. I think that I'll go with that one. Lovely. What do you miss that Miami used to have? Hmm. I think it used to be a little bit more intimate. Mm -hmm. I think in some ways, like, you know, it's it's just been built up so much that it can be really, really easy to, like, disengage with mm -hmm. people in the world around you. Okay. What, if you left Miami, and please don't leave Miami, we need you. I mean, you can leave Miami. I want you to have your life, but, you know, stay for a minute. But if you did leave Miami, what would you miss most about Miami? Mm, I think just my community. I think I would mm -hmm. miss, you know, all of the amazing people that I've met, um, you know, throughout throughout my time here. Um, and and that would be that's kind of hard to build back. Okay, what do you want Miami to look like in twenty years? Ooh. Well, first of all, obviously better urban planning, mm -hmm. less <laughs> less parking lots, but um, but I also I want I want a Miami where everyone feels respected, where everyone mm -hmm. feels heard, where everyone where everyone can can be who they are and be their own authentic selves, um, and where where all you know young people are are respected. Okay, lovely. This is extra credit. Okay. I felt I I honestly like I had this question and then I was like this is a lot to throw on someone. Mm. But you're, you seem like a good swimmer. Okay. If Miami was a novel, what would the plot be? <laughs> See? I told you. It's, not, it's an unfair question. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Um. Hmm. <laughs> um, you're... You're you're on the way you're on the way from North Miami to the beach, 
and which is which is a, a five hour trek right mm-hmm. and 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 you're you're meeting so many amazing characters along the way like it's like it's the 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 wizard of oz or something mm-hmm. and um someone cuts you off in traffic and uh uh and and it uh really 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 upsets you and that's like your villain origin story i think mm. um and uh you uh go on a rampage uh, throughout the city and then realize that actually uh, it's really not that big of a deal and maybe at some point um, they'll learn how to use a turn signal and so you get over it and then you uh, eat um, uh, croquetas. Very nice. Thank you. I didn't see the plot twist where you were having your villain moment. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, eh, it's it's like the anti hero. It's like an anti hero kind of like moment. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I use the turn signal for everyone. I over signal. I do too. Yeah, and no, I'm really good about using a turn signal, but that's not the case for many people. So nice. So you, you, what? How old are you when you came to Miami? Since when you've lived in Miami? You said you you went to, you were in Palm Beach, mm-hmm. and you've been in Miami since when? Yeah, I well, I'm actually I'm actually Broward technically, okay. uh, but a lot of people think that I am like because I'm literally down here most of the time. Like mm-hmm. if I'm outside of my house, I'm probably in Miami. So like you might as well just transport my home we'll into the it. county. Um, but I've, I've been very, very in, in like active in Miami for the better part of three years. Nice. All right. I think we're good. Do you have any questions? Like how are we doing with time? 20 minutes more? Okay. What questions do you have for me? Ooh, we're flipping the script. We're flipping the script. <laughs> okay. Um, well, not to not to copycat or, or plagiarize, mm-hmm. but but what I'm going to ask you the the hard okay. one and what? Well, if, do you want to ask me the questions and actually, I'll, I will you know leave what? my message for yeah. Miami. Yeah, I wanna I wanna know. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. What is what is Miami doing right? <sighs> Um, my default is always negative, so this is a good exercise. What Miami does right, I've always loved Miami. Yeah, I, li- I grew up in Miami, moved to New York. I lived there for 20 plus years, and New York never needs you. New York is New York. Everyone's passing through. It's very much set in its own idea of itself, and I feel that Miami is always in process, Miami is always asking questions, Miami is always developing. I think we think of development as in some negative ways when we think about overdevelopment, but I think Miami is a city that's always trying to figure out what's possible here. And I love, I love that energy. And I think to some extent, I feel like we've maybe gone a little back on that mm. in not being open to people. Mm. Um, I do think we were a city that was very welcoming mm-hmm in a way where you could just kind of be like, that's him, that's her, that's them. It was a very kind of like, I'm not judging, I'm just, you know, kind everyone, everyone's kind, everyone's very welcome, everyone has their place. Um, And that's been, I think in a way we've lost that, but I think that core of, we're still a city that's deciding what it's gonna be, who it's gonna be, how it's going to be, is very much what Miami does very well. Okay, yeah. No, 100%. What do you think Miami's doing wrong? Which is obviously the easier question. Yeah. I'm like, okay. Um, what Miami is doing wrong, I think, you know, I think we're in an interesting point where we're ta- maybe taking a little bit for granted um, who we are or what's interesting about us. I remember, I, I really love the different experiences you can have in Miami. And I think there's a way that where there's maybe a direction we're moving in where that's flattened out to some extent, mm. where you can lose a sense of where you are. Whereas before you knew, you knew you were in Little Haiti, you knew you were in Little Havana, you mm. knew you were in Kendall. There's these areas that were very distinct from each other. And I think to some extent we've lost the thread of that, that these are, these are places and these are things that we need to value. Um, I think so many, so many of us have come from somewhere else because of the experience we talked about earlier, because of a difficult experience that we were having. So in some sense, I feel like, you know, we can always be in this kind of temporary state. Mm. I know my family was probably here 30 years before they realized, oh, we're not going back to Cuba. Mm. So, uh, you know, we're always in that kind of living in two places at once. Like one foot out, one foot in. One foot out, one foot in. 
and now we got both foot in, both feet in. And I think there's a real value in that, but that's where we also have to shore up our communities and make mm. sure that you still have that vibrancy. That little Haiti is still little Haiti. That little Havana is still little Havana. That you know, Wynwood is changing a lot. That all yeah, our no, are yeah, I was gonna, right yeah, now. that's what I was gonna say. Like when I said like intimate, and now it's just like yeah, or like you know, you kind of lose a sense of like you know. Am I still in Brickle? Am I still? Because it just all kinds of, se it all like seems to be expanding. Like, together, yeah. Um, you know, we do a lot of work on housing, and I think we talk about gentrification. Yeah, I was going to ask, yeah. And I think that's a real, that's a real concern, but I also, I think an equal concern for me is the homogenization. Mm -hmm. Maybe not equal, because you want people right. to be able to have homes and be... Do you think that, that gentrification really plays a role in, like, the, that homogenization? Like, folks are, like, we have these, like, really distinct communities, but folks are kind of driven out of them. They're driven out. So if you have Overtown, mm -hmm. but you don't have the people who made Overtown what it is... Right. Is it still Overtown? Is it still Overtown? Mm -hmm. If you have Liberty City, you have Brownsville, but you don't have the community that mm -hmm. made it a place that was had its challenges, but also had its, its, sense, of, its sense of itself and who it is, its own history, then what do you have? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's, that's something that I'm concerned about losing. Yeah, no, I 100%. What is your most nostal nostalgic Miami memory? <gasps> um, I probably, okay. I guess I just have to go with the first one that popped into just to be fair. Um, I don't want to age myself, but yeah, when there was a point where in the Miami Marine stadium, um, the one that's on the water in Kiwi's Gain, where, and I had to piece this story back together because I was very young when it happened, where they brought a virgin of charity, Virgen de la Caridad, from Cuba. And they were, it was, it was, they were, it was going to be this very important event. I was there with my, my parents, my grandparents. What felt like all of Miami was in the stadium, which now I know is impossible, but everyone I knew in Miami was in that stadium. Mm -hmm. And they were bringing back in, it was, it was part of a reclaiming of her from Cuba. It was basically when the Virgin of Charity went into mm. exile. Mm. And we were all there to receive her. And there was a, there was a, a, there was a point where they started um, a, 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 a prayer to her for her to save Cuba. And it was a very thunderous voice and everyone was speaking in unison. And I remember feeling being very young, so it's just, it's, it's frightening, it's intimidating because the passion and the hurt, like they were, they were experiencing emotions. I couldn't understand what they were because mm -hmm. I had an experience in my head and understood them in that way. I didn't have words for what I was hearing and feeling. Mm -hmm. Was very powerful and I remember just incredible empathy mm -hmm. for everyone because I did feel that there was something that they desperately needed. Mm. And I, I remember feeling, I don't know that they're gonna have it. So that's my most nostalgic Miami memory when I think of being very young. Mm. And it's, it's always, and it's a very physical, it's like on those concrete benches and you're looking up. Right, and it's like, it's like all of the senses, right? Like it's really the feeling senses. the thunder and the boom of those voices and feeling that, that emotion, yeah. No. Yeah, and the image of her coming over the mm -hmm. water and like in the cape. Yeah. And the, the shine to mm -hmm. her mm -hmm. and just this luminous presence that was coming. Right. That was, was very powerful. Right. What do you miss that Miami used to have? Um, God, what do I miss that Miami used to have? I, I never want to give up on anything, so I'm always thinking, like, I can find it. Um, what do I miss that Miami used to have? Okay, I'm going to take a minute. Um, hmm. You know, I felt like there were places, we used to have places where you you didn't have to make a plan to meet people. You just had to have a plan to go to the place and you know you'd find your people. Hmm. And that was that was a very different, you know, to speak more my, my more recent Miami history, that was Wynwood Yard. Hmm. That was Versailles. You had these almost like these little parts, these little worlds that you belong to that you just had to show up and you were gonna be you were gonna be known. And I, I miss that feeling in Miami. I don't know. I think maybe it could potentially exist for other people. I hope it does. But there was such a break with COVID, um, and the pandemic, and with everyone being so separate that that sense that it could just happen, I think is is maybe there's less of that, and I miss that. Yeah, I think it's like there's so much talk about like 
the, the, the death of the third space. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like you have like your home, your work, and then like that other place that you go to. Um, and we're seeing that like in so many different communities. And I think that like there needs to be like that revitalization of like that place where you can just go and just mm-hmm. feel, you know, fueled and feel home and find community in. If you left, what would you miss about Miami? Oh, God, this is so embarrassing. I love the roosters. Mm. <laughs> it's like I go outside and I like I take in a rooster chant mm-hmm. just because I'm like, oh, I need to visit my friends. Um, during the pandemic, we had a rooster that we had to rehome. It was, I think what happened, you know, nature kind of took its own place. It like mm. kind of spread its wings, literally. And in front of my house, um, I live in front of a library, there was a rooster that we were very conscious of and we were engaging with. And because we couldn't speak to our neighbors, we didn't realize that everyone was equally invested in the same rooster. And then the city came to try and um, take it away. And it became this, everybody basically came out of their house with pitchforks and said, you can't take this rooster. And it's like then, the turkey being pardoned for Thanksgiving. Yeah, it was, it was this, this spontaneous, we were filling the streets and I'm not a confrontational person. I, would, I don't know that I could have kept my cool at the state legislature mm. the way that you did, but I remember at one point I said, the man who was taking the rooster away kept saying to me, you don't mato gallo, I'm from Pinar del Rio. <laughs> I didn't kill it. And I said, I want to see the rooster. So I demanded a proof of life of right. the rooster from the city. And then they, they, they came back and they pulled the truck around or the van around that had taken the rooster. And the little rooster was in a sack. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we negotiated to have the rooster released into our custody. Mm-hmm. And we built it a temporary space in the back. Um, and all the neighbors kept coming on. They're saying, but that rooster didn't bother anyone. And I think it was a noise complaint from further out, which we don't know that rooster. We're like, that's some other rooster. Right. This is our rooster. Right. So we rescued the rooster. Um, and then in having the space, having the rooster in my home, I would wake. It was the most gentle way to wake up. You'd think it would bother you, but having waking up to the rooster crowing, I felt like Martha Stewart. I was like, oh, these are my roosters. Stop. This is like kind of feels like you just felt like I'm this, you know, living in like, you know, this like sprawling countryside. I'm like in the middle of the city of Miami. There's no sprawling. Um, but I just love the sound of roosters and I just I, I seek it out. So if I, you know, if I can be outside, the other day I was on a, a customer service call. And I heard a rooster and I said, excuse me, was that your rooster? Was that my rooster? And you could tell the person was a little embarrassed because they're not supposed to, you, you, I guess maybe they don't want to yeah, people to feel taboo. like they're in, in some kind of <laughs> distant taboo. place. And he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. That's my And he's like, no, no, no. I just wanted to know which rooster's rooster that was. <laughs> so yeah, I think this, I would miss the sound of roosters. To me, that is, that is luxury, being able to live in a city where the roosters are, are, are co-citizens. That, what... Does that answer your question? What do you want Miami to look like in 20 years? Where just like roosters. roosters are just <laughs> at an equal As far footing. as the eye can see. No, um, truly. What do I want Miami to look like in 20 years? Y- you know, I want us to. I want. I want us to look like us. Mm. I feel that we are. We're such. Like you said, vibrancy. I think is the right word. We're such a vibrant. We're such a diverse community. And we've kind of gone into these very small spaces. We've made ourselves smaller Mm. in a way. And I don't want that to be the case. I want us to feel be a community where you look out and you see people who are like you that understand you, people who are very different, um, people who come from very different experiences and they can do that in safety. Um, I obviously would want us to be above ground. I want us to feel that we've, we're, we've become, we've identified as a city that's part of the problem we talk about, and I have to do this in my organizing work of we're at, we're at ground zero for climate. Mm-hmm. Um, I want us to be seen as a city that has, because we're cities that maybe experience problems first, we're also cities where the solutions came out of. Mm. And that happened in us bringing in people from different communities, bringing in people being a welcoming city again. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's something that we've lost um, and taking the best of the world and people who understand through empathy and through lived experience of loss what that they can build and they feel empowered to do so and that they choose Miami as a place where they want to do that. I love that. Um, 
where is the rooster, that one rooster now? <sighs> that rooster had a, had a journey. So we were able to get permission to have it in our yard for a while. Um, and then at one point there was an attack and I think a cat went at it. Um, and we did a GoFundMe for the rooster to be rehomed at Aguacate Sanctuary. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, it's, I think it's kind of like horse country. I think mm -hmm. of it as town and country. It's, it's close to where I grew up right. in, in Kendall. Um, so the rooster got this beautiful home um, built for it because it has to, I, I know a lot about roosters now. So that, that'll be another show. <laughs> but we had this home built for it and it got a little girlfriend named Placa. Okay. And they're starting a family. Oh. And then they had to, they started putting in other chickens, other hens with him. So he has his, and I think once they added more hens, then he got a little bit like, oh, he got, overwhelmed. A, little, he got a little overwhelmed. <laughs> he got a little cowed. So he's kind of like, you know, they keep him in check. But he had, he's part of this beautiful animal sanctuary. Oh, I love that. So oh, yeah. what a happy story. What was, what was his name? His, he was, <laughs> we aren't very creative. We named him Gallo, which okay. is basically a rooster in Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think he's a very iconic, like, I feel like he can fill the Gallo space. Yeah. He's a very, he's a beautiful rooster. Archi now, ar archetypal, yeah. like. Ar <laughs> that's like, the other thing. Yeah. Like, now I look at roosters, and I'm like, oh, there's this, what an iridescent tail. Like, I notice all these ro rooster features. Yeah. That were before I was just like, it's a chicken. Now yeah. I'm like, oh, no, it's like, that's a handsome rooster. Yeah, you can like tell them apart. Yeah. I love that. Um, now, the hard, the question hard question is, if Miami were a novella, what would the plot be? I would say Miami is a novella. Well, yeah. And we're living it. <laughs> um, you know, I think Miami, um, if it was a plot, I think it would be around... I think the best and the worst of Miami very much plays out in our politics. Mm. And I think maybe that's why, look, I, I come from a writing background. Mm -hmm. You can't write Miami. Mm. You just have to, some, you know. You just have to live it. You just have <laughs> to live it. Like Miami, you can, there's no parody, no version of Miami that outdoes Miami. Mm. Um, so I just think through our politics, through the, the players, through these figures, I think we really see who Miami is. So I, I think of it as a political drama. And there's um, a maybe some very entrenched interest, but mm. then there's a real community and you know a collective sense that is always going to be in opposition to or challenging that. So I, mm. I see it as a, as a kind of like, you know, we could have one of those plots where it's like, very like drawn out court case and then somebody makes a really beautiful speech and yeah. then there's the slow clap moment mm. and then it's like a very celebration you know celebratory gonga or something oh i love that okay yeah. sweet that's <laughs> amazing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so i think we're we're, we're we're closing in on time um you know we have i want to make sure that you have enough space so prism if you can drive so we have the school board meeting yeah and you said that that's Wednesday. Yeah. Um, if they go to your site, do you want to make be very specific about what your site is? Uh, that people can go to right now and take the next step. Yes. So to get for the school board specifically, uh -huh. um, you can go to www.prismfl.org mm -hmm. forward slash quick dash links. And that'll give you like the main links. The easier one to remember is check us out on Instagram. Mm -hmm. That's prism.fl on Instagram. Click the link in our bio, which is the same link I just said. And that will that will show you where it is. It's the, the one that says um, Miami Dade students uh, demand to be heard. Okay, wonderful. And then if they wanted to become more involved, because this is gonna be uh, li live online, so we have the school board meeting, which is March 13th, mm -hmm. but then just getting involved in the organization, what kind, what avenues do people have to get more deeply involved with the work that you well, do? Well, first up is to uh, sign up to volunteer with us. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can also do it on the site. Uh, there's like a little get involved page or, and it has like a thing for volunteer forums. You can fill out a volunteer form um, and get engaged that way. But there's, we're always looking, we're always looking for volunteers to table. We got, we got, Miami Beach Pride coming up mm -hmm. next month, so there's always ways to get engaged. I didn't and realize Miami. So what are your what are your Pride plans? Uh, we've done so many Prides. Mm -hmm. I think we're trying to like get out of a rhythm and and into like 
something new with pride, like trying to explore like new things with pride. But um, as always, we are going to be tabling, um, which is always a joy. Mm -hmm. I love just like chatting up people, talking about the work that we're doing. Uh, We have a little trivia wheel. So everyone loves a trivial wheel. Obviously. You can get prizes. Do you want to borrow my questions? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, for People sure. Do wheel for sure. Um, and it's your little trivial wheel. And then obviously we're walking in the parade. Mm-hmm. And so we want as many people as would like to walk you don't have to pay anything like all you have to do is sign up with us so we would love for folks who want to get engaged in that way we like chanting we're very very big on on chanting during during parades and who leads the chant are you are you the chant leader oh okay. oh of course i'm i'm loud so of course. okay so you're 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 the bullhorn person mm. you're the one that's just like comes mm-hmm. up and with i got the- rhythm and everything <laughs> i I keep everyone on their toes. What's what's your go-to chant? Ooh, that's a good because there's so many good mm-hmm. ones, and I'm really good at cycling. I got the mm-hmm. I got the this is how many we do before people get bored, and I gotta switch to the next one and keep keep it fresh, you know. But one of my favorites is um, I actually learned from Tom Lander with State School South Florida, mm-hmm. and it is erasers are for blackboards, and then you say not for people. Okay. Mm-hmm. Nice. I like that. It's very visual. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we have Pride coming up, so you can, I think that's a good, like, if you want to be a volunteer, you want to do it around Pride, because um, there's fun. Now's the time. Now's, now's the time. The to fun is have baked the fun. in. Yeah. Um, what are your plans for this year, for this election year? Like, how involved are you going to get in um, getting out the vote, getting people mobilized? What are what are some of your priorities long term? Yeah, so we're thinking about doing some, we, we've never actually done, like, voter reg work. We're thinking about, we're thinking about dipping our toes into it, like, maybe some partnerships with, mm-hmm. with some of the other voter reg work you know, orgs in Miami. So you might see us, you might see us doing that. I'm not making promises that you'll see us doing <laughs> that. Um, but I think by and large, it's making sure that folks are educated, right? So making sure that folks know about the issues that are going on in their communities, especially at, that, at the school board level, of course, um, and uh, and just keeping people engaged in that way. Um, and, and then once again, like uplifting young, young voices. I think that's so, so, so important that we find ways to uplift uplift young people in this work and in this fight. Um, and so finding, finding new ways to, to engage young people to develop the next generation of leaders, I think um, that's really uh, a space that that will um, that will hold, um, you know, through the next the rest of the year. Sure. And when are you running? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's in the cards, but, right, but not not soon. No. Soon. <laughs> what do you think? Do you think it makes? Do you think it's easy for people to feel think about running? Do you feel like there's people who just know they want to do it? I just I just feel like sometimes we don't we we can think about how difficult it is Mm. but what makes you think this is something that you'd consider because usually it's a hard no yeah i mean if you put the running question people go that's me i'm like no I don't know. It's the it's just the amount of people that have been like that have told me that I should run for public office. Mm-hmm. I think you know that kind of gets you gets you a little hyped up about it. I also think like I'm gonna I'm gonna coin it right now, even though there's probably a better name for it. But it's just like the Tallahassee effect. I think mm-hmm. that Ooh. I've witnessed so many people that like spend any time in the Capitol building and they're like, I want to run for public office, and they're like, I've never considered that previously. Mm-hmm. But then you like see elected officials and you're like, I could do that better than you. And I think okay. there's something about just like seeing that like mm-hmm. witnessing that and just being like yeah i need to be in that space like i need to like something someone needs to fix all of that okay. um and I so i love that for you yeah yeah but i think i think it i think it probably wouldn't be tallahassee it would probably be school board is where i would is where i would i would dip my toes in okay yeah i'm i'm here for all of that um very excited um so yeah i think we're wrapping up um, we're good. Do you have any, this is, this is our first show. So thank you for, if you're watching, watching Max, thank you for going first. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Like I said, like I said, a pioneer. <laughs> pioneer. Tallahassee effect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Copywriting that. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we're all vi- looking excited to vote for you. Uh, all right. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll let y'all know when you can. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will be here um, every other Monday. So I think what's March 25th is our next show. I'm very excited to introduce you to people who are making real positive change um, in our community. So that's it. See you soon. Um, follow us online, Instagram, at Miami Freedom Project. Um, DM us. If you want to leave a message for Miami, we'll have the prompt questions. We would love to hear from you. And we will read them on air next time. All right, that's it. It's a wrap.